tuning in. Thank you for tuning in. Welcome to my uh, stream. I am going to pick off where I left off yesterday. I was developing a module for Keep Talking and Nobody Explodes. No, it's not this one. This one's finished. I'm going to open it now. It's called Black Hole. And we're going to continue developing it uh, exactly where we left off yesterday. Okay, so let's take a look. Hello, Space Screw. Nice to see you. Okay. Um, let's have a little message top of the screen saying developing a module for Catane Black Hole. Right, okay, let's do that. Okay, um, let's join the channel. Hello, everybody. Nobody is here. Maybe someone will join at some point. I don't know. Okay, so here we are. Where did we leave off yesterday? Well, if, I'm, if I start this module, let's see. So we've got these sort of swirly things that happen. And um, we've we've uh, succeeded in implementing the input mechanism, which which was um, oh, that's right. I had this. Let me very quickly find this. Uh, there we go. We have this sort of graphical representation. The uh, final version is the one that I'm using. So ignore the other ones for now. So um, I'm going to remove that debug logging so that uh, it doesn't fill the uh, uh, fill, fill the whole uh, console. Let's um, let's move this around so that you can see things. There you go. Okay, I guess I just press enter. Okay, so now if I run this, and the solution code is supposed to be zero zero four zero four three two. Let's see. Uh, zero. So zero is hold for one tick. So I think I got a strike because I entered a three because I was too quick. Let's do this again. Okay, I've got two zeros and then I have a four. Now four consists of a long hold. So click, click. There you go. That's a four. And then we want another zero. Is that right? Yes. Zero is that. Okay. Do that. That's a zero. And then that's another four. The last digit is three and two. Now three is this, so we hold. Let go, hold again, and let go. And that's a three. And then for the two, we do a click and then a hold. So we do a click and then a hold. And the module is solved. OK, so what's missing? Well. The first thing that I want to happen is I want these swirly things around the black hole to sort of disappear into the black hole as, you know, they would just sort of move inwards and then disappear underneath or behind the black hole, I suppose. Um, um, oh, <laughs> I don't really call them fins anymore, but that's an interesting idea. I could make the size a little less uh, uh, uniform. That's actually a really good idea. I'll, I'll do that later. So for now, what I want is I want these swirls to disappear uh, as you enter the correct code. And I also want them to disappear uh, when you solve other modules. Okay, let's, let's go back to the manual and remind ourselves of what the rules of this uh, module are. Because there is this unusual thing, which is if you solve a different module on the bomb after entering a digit of the code, the code gets shortened by two digits. This way, the code for a single black hole can be reduced from seven to three digits by solving other modules between entering digits. So I need to implement this because that's, that's one of the main ideas that, you, that the module isn't supposed to be very hard, but if you leave it until the end of the bomb, then it gets laborious because then it's seven digits instead of just three. So um, how do we do this? Well, in order to do this, we have to monitor um, the number of solved modules on the bomb. So um, we're going to have a variable uh, that says, well, we already have a last time variable. Let's also have a last solved variable. Okay. 
and um, in the same way that we initialized last time to the time of the bomb, we initialized last solved to the number of solvable modules. Um, I suppose I should call it unsolved. Or I, I just start at zero and just count the number of... That, that actually makes more sense. Let's start at zero. Okay. So during the update frame, let's see if the time is different. And then um, get solve module names dot count. And if that is different from last solved, of course, we want to update this. Now, we need to make sure that this only happens once after every digit that we enter. So, oh, and we also need to make sure that it only happens on the module where you entered the digit. So, in our um, bomb info class, in this, not bomb info, but the black hole info class, I suppose, we need to remember um, the specific module uh, where the last digit was entered and a boolean. Well, actually, we don't need a boolean to say whether we can reduce because we can just set this to null. So every time you enter a digit, this will, set, this will be set to uh, the, the module. And then when you solve a module, it will check whether this is not null. And if so, reduce the number of digits and then set it to null so it doesn't happen a second time. Uh, you want to, oh, you want a link to the Google Doc. There you go. You're welcome. Okay. So, um, you entered, oh yeah, we have this process thing. So, every time you successfully entered a correct digit, we want info dot, um, last digit entered equals this. So now we know that an, uh, a digit was successfully entered here. Um, unless, if, if that digit was responsible for solving the module, then, then you can't do this. So um, I'm going to put that in an else clause so that it only happens when you didn't just solve the module. OK, now when, when we detect that this has changed, we check if the last digit enter is not null. And if so, well, first of all, we set it to null. And also, um, we have this digits expected variable, which I suppose we can uh, subtract two from. But see, the thing is, it might have a value of one or something. Um, so we, can, we cannot allow it to get smaller than one. So we, we actually need the max value of 1 or uh, what it was minus 2. Okay, so this way, if the number of digits is 2, if the number of digits still left to enter is 2, then it will reduce the code only by um, only by 1. Now, remember that the number of digits expected is the number of digits expected by all black hole modules together, right? So if you have a single black hole module that's, that expects only one more digit, then, uh, you know, it doesn't matter that the whole code gets uh, reduced by, by 2. Okay. So the next thing um, we the next thing we need to do is that if you have two black hole modules on the bomb, uh, one of them, so the idea is that one of them should uh, mark itself as solved after a certain number of digits have been entered. Um, so I suppose we should have a digit expected for the sort of the entirety of all the black holes together, but we should also have a um, number of digits expected for each individual module. So I'll put that here. And this starts out at 7. It always starts out at 7. Um, there we go. And then if the number of digits expected goes down, then the number of digits expected for this module should also go down. So digit expected is equal to... Oh, I see. Um, Ah, see, I almost made a mistake, because if this is not null, it could be another black hole module. And you don't want multiple black hole modules 
um, executing this code because every single one of them would subtract two and then you know it would end up subtracting four. So actually we want to check if it's this. We want to check if it's the very module that we're currently in. So uh, this should also be that except using that. There we go. Hello Tyler, also known as Roblox Review. Hello up to Prince, hello Blananas, hello everybody. Thank you for joining my stream. Okay, so um, now I'm going to try and test this by adding uh, two black hole modules to my scene. And obviously I'm gonna have to move them. So I'm gonna call this uh, number one, number two, I guess. So I'm gonna move this one negative point one and this one positive point one. And I'm going to move the camera away so you can see both of them. So now the expected code should have 14 digits. And actually, before I run this, I should probably add some logging so that I can see in the console what's going on. So here I'm going to say, um, all right, this will never happen, will it? Because we only have like whole modules. I would have to create another module just to mimic the sort of solving yeah actually okay let's just add the um the debug message so um you solved another module uh so uh, two digits are um slashed from the code okay Right, okay, so I want that. And another thing is that digit expect, right, digits expected, um, when the number of digits expected for a module is reached, that module needs to mark itself as solved. So um, let, let's see where we pass the module, which is here. So this is where we enter a correct digit. Um, the number of digits entered is increased. I suppose we also need to count the number of digits entered on each module. So I'm going to do that, digits entered. Um, and that obviously starts at zero. Uh, digit entered equals zero. Right, and now, um, OK, so when we mark the module as solved, there you go. Digits entered plus plus if digits entered equals digits expected. Oh, oh, I see. No, this is the actual criterion for this, isn't it? There we go. Whereas here, right, I'm just going to say this. I suppose I can actually just do that like this because it was a correct digit after all. and if this module is solved, well, you know, then the um, it it will never run this again. So, uh, hang on, let me check if this one. Ah, oh yeah, here it will not run this code again. So this check will never happen. So that's fine. I I meant this check. Okay, hello, Tim. Oh, right, I've already read that. Okay. Okay. So now, let's see if this works so let, let's just run this something is going to go horribly wrong i'm sure no reference exception on in line 66 let's find out what that is um okay why would that be null so let's let's find some let's oops let's add some uh, log messages to find out like how um uh, let's see if info is null and let's see if info.modules is null okay so uh info equals null and info equals null or info.modules equals null let's run that Um, okay, info null false, info.modules null, 
also false, but it's true for the other one. That is very strange. Do they get different serial numbers? I, I highly doubt that. Um, there should be only one serial number here. Um, so info, oh, I see here, info is null. Oh, interesting. Let's see. Oh, I see, else, oh, info is equal to info's serial. There you go. I suppose it's probably a bit cleaner if I do it this way. There we go. And come on, there we go. Now it's uh, working. Okay, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14. So we do have a 14 digit code. I'm going to use the left module first. Um, and actually, I'm going to rig this because you know I know that the digit entering thing works. So I'm going to rig this so that this, the code is always zero. So it's a bit easier to enter. Um, so here I'm just going to say info.solution code is equal to. Um, Right, it's uh, this is a, an array of it's a list of integers. So I'm just gonna clear that and then say for each uh, len, len uh, the solution code length is uh, info dot digits expected info dot solution code dot add uh, zero. Okay, so now the solution code is just gonna be all zeros, and I'm gonna have to remember to remove that later. Okay, so now. If I go back here, entering a zero is re reasonably easy. So let's see. There's a zero. There's another zero. Another zero. Okay, that's the fourth zero. I want to enter seven zeros. Module passed. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You solved another. Oh, okay. Now the other black hole module believes that I solved a module, even though it's the black hole module that I solved. It shouldn't count the black hole module as a other module. So I need to um, take care of that, um, which means that we can't just go by the number of um, solved modules. We have to look at what those modules actually are. So when we start. Here, the um, last solved, okay, last solved is zero, that's good. But then here, the number of solved should be get solved module names. Um, it's a list of strings. So where uh, module name is not equal to um, black hole. Okay. Um, I, I want to output a log message. No, actually, I'll I'll just see if it. Um, I'll I'll just try this again. Okay, so. One. Two. Three. Four. Five. Six. Seven. Okay, so the first one is now solved, and now if I click it again. Nothing happens. I don't get strikes or anything. The other module is still active. So now I can do this. You entered zero, which is correct. I hope so. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Module passed. There we go. Okay. Now I need to make sure that it actually checks the the, the correct digits of the code. So in my rigging, I'm going to uh, make it so that. Okay, you know what? I'm just gonna. There you go. I'm gonna add seven zeros, and then I'm gonna add seven. Um, what is what else is easy? Yeah, I think I'm gonna add fours. Those those are easy to enter as well. So now I have seven zeros and seven fours. So it should ex expect seven zeros. And then seven fours. And this time, I'm going to enter them back and forth between the two modules uh, to make sure that it actually expects seven zeros no matter which module you uh, uh, enter them on. Um, okay, let's start this. 
So, okay, I'm gonna get a strike because I misclicked. Thank you. Uh, let's try that again. So here we have you entered a zero, which is correct. I'm glad that you agree. So that's three zeros, four, five. Huh. The left module is not accepting any input anymore. Well, that, that is very interesting. I, I bet that there is a problem arising from the fact that uh, the, the module on the right still works. Okay, so now we have five zeros. Six. Seven. So now it should accept a four. So let's, let's do another zero and see if I... There we go. I, I got a strike. In fact, I got two strikes. Oh my gosh, this is really bad. I need to, um, need to debug that. But those both came from the second black hole, which I'm reasonably certain is the one on the right. Um, okay. So now it expects force. Let's see if the module on the left works now. It does not. It just doesn't respond. Uh, has it marked itself as solved? No, it has not. Okay. Well, let's see if I can finish the module on the right. Okay, it did accept a four and then marked itself as passed. So I I can't remember, but I think I did um, right click to back it out. No, I, really? Are you sure? Okay, fine. Let's see if if that theory is correct. One. Two. Oh, indeed. Thank you, Kate. I didn't realize that was necessary because it isn't necessary in the game. Okay, so let's see if I can finish this module by um, entering the remaining fours. Now one more, and it should be solved, I believe. Click. Oh, that's only. F oh yeah, there's one more. Let's do boing, boing, and there we go. Bomb, bomb solved. Okay, so that seems to work. Now I need to create a sort of temporary module which I can use to just, you know, just solve a module. So I'm going to um, create a new prefab um, a dummy module. Um, hey, Kata, since you're here. So I noticed that when I create a prefab, it's like completely empty and there is no UI here to add any components. So how do I make this? A um, you know a KM bomb module or or anything really, um, I don't know this. So uh, let me know how to do that. In the meantime, I'm gonna copy and paste this, and uh, um, no, actually, I need I need you to tell me this because I don't know how to um, create a new prefab from this. Um, yeah, I literally don't know how to create a prefab, uh, except perhaps by copying and pasting the file in Explorer, I could do that. And I'm going to call that the dummy module. Um, so I'm, I'm going to have to delete this prefab and rename that. There we go. Now this dummy module, I'm going to uh, call it dummy module. And the... Uh, script is, uh, has to be a different one. So I guess I'm gonna uh, take a copy of, not that, this, and call it dummy module.cs, and then open that in Visual Studio. Call that the dummy module used for debugging, simply click to solve. Okay, so all that needs is uh, this, and then public. Um, I suppose, no, I, I think I do want a KM selectable on it, which you have to click. Uh, let's get rid of that, get rid of everything. No, do not get rid of, oh, I deleted the, oh, okay, well, I guess I don't even need the module ID thing, so. Um, Let's get rid of everything, all of this, and all of this. 
So now we have a very simple module and we can just say private pool is solved equals false and module.handle pass is solved equals true. Okay. Hmm. Okay, Tith, are you still there? Because uh, hmm, you haven't responded to my question. If anyone else knows the answer to the question, please let me know. Um, okay, so now we're going to copy. Oh, yeah, we need to remove this component and add one called dummy script, dummy module. Okay, so this is. Huh. Oh, I see. Wait, what? No, it is a okay KM bomb. Why, why can I not? That's no, very strange. Okay, let's just put that in here in the scene. And let's move it down point 0.1, point 0.2, I guess. Like there. And let's also move the camera down point 0.1 or something. There you go. Now, our dummy module is not going to have a black hole hole. But I am going to put a, uh, um, a box there. So the hole. Um, oh, I see. I just. Oh, undo. Oh, there you go. Okay, let's delete those two things. Um, so this should be a okay, KM selectable with a highlight. Um, and it, the, the highlight is going to be a um, quad. Um, let's add a mesh renderer to see what it looks like. Okay, that, that's uh, fine. Except that if I make it, this disappears. So I probably have to rotate it 180 degrees. There we go. Now it's selectable. Um, suppose I can make it slightly smaller and significantly smaller and also move it a little to the left. I don't know why I'm paying so much attention to so much detail on something that literally doesn't matter. There you go. So that's the highlight and then the, um, the hole, which I suppose I'm going to call button. And I think I'm going to put highlight underneath it and move this up and delete that parent. Uh, and make the button the KM selectable. So this is now a KM selectable with uh, the parent being the dummy module, the um, highlight being the, that highlight. Okay, and now the um, mesh, which is here, is going to be a cube, right? And the material, I'll, I'll just make that standard material. Oh. No, 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 undo that, undo that. I want to change the actual material, which is this one here. Default diffuse, there you go. Let's make that button very much smaller than that. Like maybe 0.05. There we go. Okay, and then the highlight. Um, I suppose. Okay, let's take a look at the scene. Let's move the highlight up. Ah, I see it's too small to be seen. Okay, let's make it bigger. Uh, oh, of course, one is now the size of the cube, so let's make it 1.5. There you go. And then we can move it down. That's still visible. Okay. So now let's apply this for the dummy module. Go back to game. And I suppose we can remove the mesh renderer now. And hopefully, if I run this now, that button should be clickable. Ooh, no reference exception. Um, ah, okay. I forgot to set these variables. Um, and I also forgot to set the child, so I guess I need the button here. But the important thing is these here need to be dummy module, dummy module, dummy module, and button. There we go. Apply, save, run. Okay, so now if I click on the button, bingo, that module marks itself as solved. Now, let's see if I enter a zero here, which I've done now, you entered zero, and now I'm going to, I'm going to select this module and click the button. You solved another module, so two digits are flashed from the code. So now I should have to enter only five in total, so four remaining. Let's see if that is true. One, two, three, four, and the module is passed. 
and now the other module should expect only seven. But um, before I laboriously uh, test that, I'm going to add more dummy modules and see if I can reduce the code from 14 to, as it says here, six. And let's see if that works. So I'm going to take, um, so I would need four copies of the dummy module for that to work. So let's put this here and make, I call it one. One, two, three, four, five. Five? Why did I make it five? Okay, so um, these should go to positive point one, and these should move down a bit. There we go. Main camera, move that to here. And I suppose I can now make it a bit closer. Phew. And let's run this. So. Now I should be able to enter a zero here and then click this and then enter another zero here. Okay, click this. Okay, and now if I enter another zero, this module should mark itself as solved. And it does. Very good. So now if I were to solve yet another module, it shouldn't matter because um, you know this module just solved itself, so it doesn't count if you now solve another module. I should really test this. Yeah, actually, I think I'm going to test this. So if I uh, click this now, pass that, bingo, nothing happened. So now this other module still expects uh, seven digits, and we've entered three, so the next four digits are still expected to be zero. So let's enter a zero here. That is correct. And then I'm going to solve a module. This one's already solved. Let's solve this one. Okay, so now, now it should expect... So it should now expect four more. And we've entered... Oh gosh, I've lost track of how many we've entered. Let's see, we've entered one, two, three, four. So we've entered four. So three more of them should be zeros, right? That's correct. That's correct. And that's correct. Now the next one should be a four. Let's see if I'm right. Bingo. Four is correct and then the module is passed. So it expected exactly four more as I said. So everything is working exactly as intended. This is cool. So the next thing I want to do is to, to make those swirly things moving around the black hole to disappear, to, to go in when, uh, you know, when every time that a digit is sort of relinquished, regardless of whether it's by entering a digit or by solving another module. So, so I have this array called swirls, which contains these uh, swirl objects, but once they're not visible anymore, I should probably destroy them so that, you know, they don't uh, cause any uh, performance. They don't require any performance anymore. So uh, in, this, in this code that handles them, uh, this one here, I'm going to say if this is not equal to null. Okay, that way I can just set them to null once I've destroyed them and then uh, it'll be... Uh, it won't crash. Okay, so, hello. Not quite sure why you said hello, but you are right, 12 minutes with no messages, that's quite a long time. Um, whew, okay. Yes, yes, Spy, I've, I've heard you, I will do that later. Um, for now, I want to do the thing that, that uh, I mentioned. Okay, so there are two places where um, the uh, swirls should disappear. One of them is when you enter a digit, and the other one is... Ah, I can actually... Ah, I have an idea. You see, um, we have digits entered and we have digits expected. So digit expected minus digit entered is the remaining digit. Uh, to, to be entered. So we can check whether that value change, changes 
And if it does, then um, okay then, spy. Um, okay, here we go. Unfortunately, um, I won't be able to explain everything in text. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to have to keep talking rather than typing. Okay, so. Oof, I kind of lost my train of thought right now. So, um, we have this world's array, and we... That's right, so every... Yeah, okay. So, we don't even need to check whether it changed, because we can just go um, for i equals 0 to that number um, times 7. Times 7. So initially, the number of digits expected is 7, and the number of digits entered is 0. So actually, no, I want to go from, from this to 7, because there's always going to be, no, sorry, um, 49, because there's always going to be 49 swirl objects. Um, <laughs> Kate says, so Kate says, I, I take it you don't know the answer to my earlier question? My question was that when I create a blank prefab, I don't know how to assign um, components to it because there's no button for it in Unity. If, if you could um, explain that to me or give me some pointers, that would be great. Okay, so, so initially this value will be 49, so this for loop won't, simply won't do anything. Um, but then once it does do something, I'm going to say that if swells uh, i is not already null, then we're going to set it to null, but we're also going to start a coroutine uh, that will uh, disappear as well. And it will take the transform. Um, and in this coroutine, I'm just going to go... Uh, well, actually, let's, let's do it like this. We have a and uh, we we want this to 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 last or to to take uh, about one second, and we are going to measure how much has elapsed. And then while that duration time hasn't elapsed yet, we're going to wait for one frame and then add the delta time. So now we know how much time has elap elapsed during that frame, and now we're going to say transform dot uh, local scale which really we should, we should call that the swirl, just to not confirm, uh, con confuse it with, 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 this, whoops, uh, with this transform here, which is the transform of the actual module. Okay, so swirl local scale should now be, um, well, it starts out with a local scale of 1, I believe. Let's see where we instantiate these swirls. There we go. The local scale starts out with 1, 1, 1. And I want to gradually reduce it to a size at which it's no longer visible, which is probably only 0.9, you know, because the, you know, it's, it's going to move into the black hole and then disappear. So let's go back to the uh, coroutine and set this to um, bar size is equal to. So the duration uh, divide, no, sorry, elapsed divided by duration gives me a number from 0 to 1, 0 at the start and 1 at the end. So I want to multiply that by um, 0.9, I suppose, um, and then, right, except that this would go from 0 to 0.9, I want to, no, 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 I want 0.1, and then plus 0.9, so now it would go from 0.9 to 1, but we wanted to go from 1 to 0.9, so we're just going to go 1 minus that, and 1 minus 0.9 is the same as 0.1, so there is a mistake. 
right, it's because this needs to be in parentheses, which is the same as making this a minus, and then 1 minus 0 0.9 is the same as 0 0.1, and that's also wrong, because that would definitely not, oh gosh, I'm really confused, okay, start again. Okay, so this, this is a value that goes from 0 to 1, so this is a value that goes from 0 to 0 0.1. Right, and if we go 0 0.1 minus that, then it will go from 0 0.1 to 0. And then we go 1 minus that, and it should go from. No. We want. If we go 0 0.9 plus that, now it will go from 1 to 0 0.9. Okay, so now let's remove these parentheses, and we find that this adds up to 1. Um, yeah, th this should be correct. <laughs> wow, that took me ages. Okay, now let's see if that works. Um, also, we don't really, I mean, because, you see, elapsed could go beyond duration. Well, actually, in this case, it doesn't matter. I mean, usually what I would do here is a math f dot max, but it doesn't matter in this case, even if it goes a little bit beyond one. So at the end of the coroutine, we want to destroy the swirl. I'm going to say the game object, and uh, and the array will already have it set to null at this point. So I haven't tried to do empty preface, so I have no answer. Thank you, Kate Seth. Uh, uh, I, I suspect as much. Okay. Poof. Now let's see if this works. So if I run this, and I enter a zero here. Aha, I don't know if you saw this, but one of the swirls did in fact disappear. Let me enter another zero, which is correct. Okay, now if I solve one of those modules, um, then that should disappear two of them, which means that four have disappeared, so only three are left. That is indeed the case. Uh, now if I enter another zero, oh yeah, I need to use the right mouse button to back out of a module. Okay, and now there's only two swirls left. Now if I solve another module, it should remove only one of them. Ooh, it removed both of them. Um, it should have removed only one of them because there needs to be, um, you know, something left to do on the module. Ah, uh, index, I knew it, I knew it, I knew it. <laughs> oh my gosh, that was interesting. So, when we uh, process a digit, which is here, and it's a correct digit. Um, digit entered, oh no, 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 it's when you solve a module, so it's under update. So here, when we solve a module, which is here. Um, hmm. Ah. I'm an idiot. Okay, digits expected is inclusive of the digits that we've already entered. So I need this to be uh, digits entered plus one, and then this is symmetric. Uh, I need that here as well. So there's always at least one digit left um, to enter. So if digits entered is zero and digits expected is two, then it'll be one. Okay, so that, that seems to be correct. So let's try that again. Here is a zero, and then I'll enter another zero to generate the same situation that we had last time. Then I click this, and now um, there are three swirls left, so I enter another zero. I think I just messed up. Yep, I got a strike. Let's try that again. There we go, that's a zero. Now we have two swirls left, and now I'm going to click this, and it removes only one swirl. Very good. That is correct. And now if I uh, enter another zero. Not only do the swirls disappear, oh, the swirls did not disappear, but anyway, the module mark itself is solved, so that's correct. But the swirls still need to disappear. Why do they, do they not disappear? It's because when we mark it as solved, which is here, um, hmm, digit entered is in fact equal to digit expected. So, oh, oh, I see. It's because we said is solved to true, and then here inside update that 
prevents that from being executed. So I'm going to move that above the if so that this still happens. Um, right, so at every frame it will go through this 49 element array to check if they're all null, but if they're all going to be null, so it's going to be reasonably fast. Now let's try this again. So we have a, I think I messed up again. Yep, another strike, there we go. A zero, and another zero. And then I'll solve another module, click. Very good. Enter another zero. And now we have two swirls left. I'm gonna go here, solve this. And we have one swirl left. Okay, so this is correct. And then click that. It goes in and disappears, very good. However, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but the rotation of the swirl uh, stopped, which is understandable because um, the, the, the place where the things are rotated here, right, it stops happening as soon as they're set to null. So I'm actually going to not make it null immediately. Um, instead, if I, if I don't make it null immediately, then this for loop will keep starting the same coroutine. So I need another way of doing this. I have an idea. No way, that doesn't work either. Um, Yeah, I have an idea. I'm, I'm actually just going to make it two separate arrays. Swirls visible and swirls um, active or something. Okay, so um, swirls, swirls active, in swirls active it'll be set to null immediately and in swirls visible it'll be set to null once it's done. Okay, so here I'm going to set uh, both of these. Well, it's visible, right? And then okay, there we go. Now we have um, two of those arrays containing the exact same objects. Now in the update method, I want to check for swirls active, right? And this time, instead of set, uh, instead of passing in the object, I'm going to pass in the index so that the uh, coroutine can set the, the entry in the other array uh, to null. So inside disappear swirl, we're actually going to use, um, so var swirl is going to be uh, swirls visible of i, or ix, I guess, which is the index. There we go. And then at the end here, we're going to say swirls visible index equals null. Yeah, that should do it. Okay, let me just very quickly take a glance at this to make sure this is correct. Both active, yeah. Okay, that should work. Okay. Ooh, error, the name, oh, okay, I forgot to. Okay, let's take a look. Oh, yeah, that. So this should be swells visible. So now, um, we enter a zero here, then we solve a module, uh, then we enter a zero here, then we, en uh, then we solve another module, okay, and then we enter another zero, and that's passed. Now, if I were to solve this module, it should not do anything, but uh, I want to try this again. This time I'll pay closer attention to the actual animation of the swirls. Um, like this, solve it. Enter another zero, and that is correct. Okay. And then solve this. Okay, that, that seems to be looking good. Now I've lost track, of, I think I've entered only six zeros. Um, 
no, hang on. I I entered three on the left and two on the so it's it's still one more zero. So uh, it it's still zero. I, it's it's not a four yet. Let's do that. And now I'm gonna very closely. Yeah, that looks good. Okay, this is exactly how I want it. Okay, now now I'm going to implement uh, spy's uh, suge suggestion. So uh, one problem with the suggestion is that the swirls, um, you know, there, there isn't much substance to them. So if I move them too far out, then they'll look disjointed from the black hole. But um, that's okay. I'll um, I'll try it. So the local scale, um, I suppose I can. Okay, so var scale. I'm going to make it a range from I don't know point. Nine five, I guess. No, let's no, let's make it that. And one point, I don't know, one point one. Let's try that. Um, scale, scale, scale. And then in the coroutine, routine, which disappears as well, I'm going to have to say um var start value equals uh, swirls visible, which is actually swirl dot um, local scale. I'm just going to use the x because they're all going to be the same. The scale of the transform rate. Oh, okay. Yeah, there, there wasn't an error. Okay, start value that and the end value, I'm just going to put it in here should be 0.9. I think we decided. Okay. Um, now I need. Uh, okay, so Elapsed divided by duration is going to go from 0 to 1. So 1 minus that is going to go from 1 to 0. And then we multiply that by uh, end value minus start value. Actually, yeah, no, it's ah, because this is going to be negative because the start value is greater than the end value. So that, that cancels out with the other. Um, right. So this goes from 0 to 1. So this will go from 0 to the difference between end value and start value. So if I add start value, then it'll go from start value to end value. There you go. This should work. And now I'm, I'm going to increase the size of the camera a little because um, right. Okay. Just so I can see the swirls more, more easily. There is a variable color names that is assigned, but its value is never used. Let's take a look at this. Um, that is indeed never used. So let's just get rid of it. I don't know why that was there. Whoops, <laughs> I just pressed F6 to build the asset bundle, but I don't really need to do that yet. Okay. So now we see the problem that I mentioned. You can see this blue one here is disjointed from the module. You see it. Uh, it sort of hovers over the uh, the black hole. Also, um, let me follow it around the. Yeah. Okay. So, um, not all of the blue ones have the same size because the uh, you know the the random number is decided separately for each um, for each individual swirl. So I think this looks good, but we need to um, you know find some better uh, ranges. So. 1.1 is too big. And maybe we can have something smaller than 0 0.99. So let's make it 0 0.95. Right, now now they are too far away, as in too many of them are too far in and too small. So I'm I'm gonna change that back to 99. Okay, that looks like a good range. I suppose I could um, increase the size of the image to uh, make it uh, to to give it a greater variation. But actually, I'm I'm happy with that. So I'm gonna take. So, um, are you happy with this? Let's see if he responds. In the meantime. Um, let's see what else needs to be done. Let me take a look at the manual. So we've done this. We've done this. Um, we've definitely done all of that. I think we are done. Ooh. <laughs> Added a two and deleted. Okay. Um, 
Okay, now there's another thing that I wanted to do is I wanted to count the number of times that each digit occurs in here. And then if they're not even, if they're not evenly spread, then I was going to, you know, generate a new table. So let, let's see just how many times this. There are 20 of those. Also 20 of those. Also 20 of those. Aha, so they are in fact all... Yeah, there are no fives because it's from 0 to 4. So we have 20 of each. So that's actually good. Um, let's see how many occur in each row. Uh, to do that, I'm going to take this grid and I'm going to open the uh, Catain stuff, uh, which we talked about last time, where I have some, uh, you know, ancillary code that is not really part of the module. So I'm going to generate a method called analyze here, which has this uh, grid. Uh, there we go. So um, for i equals 0 to 10, let's write down, let's write out to the console uh, row i equals, now for each of the numbers from 0 to 10, we want to, sorry, from 0 to 4, which means 0, 5, there are five different values. Um, let's also call this row so that I can call this i. Um, I want to say um, i occurs how many times? Well, um, in your mobile dot range zero five select. Um, no, I there are ten values in this row, so so column, um, and I want to count how many times grid row column equals i. And then I'm going to put commas in between those. And let's run this. OK, so um, there is only one zero and three fours in this row. And there are four zeros. Yeah, this is a little unbalanced. Um, let's also take a look at the uh, columns. So uh, column this uh, row so, column. Okay, let's run that. Ah, oh, come on, put a new line in between. Okay, there we go. Um, yeah, that's also pretty unbalanced. There, there are no fours at all in the last column. And no three is in that column. Okay, so um, we have ten. So e each row has. So what I really want is for every row to have two copies of every number, which is the same as having a ten by ten grid of uh, numbers from zero to nine, and then taking everything modulo five. Correct. Um, so fortunately, I already have. Uh, some code that generates such a grid. Uh, generate grid. Let me see where I have that. Uh, generate grid. It's in grid generator. Grid generator dot generate grid. There you go. With 10, uh, minimum number 0, maximum number 9. Um, and I don't think I need any of that. However, I am going to create a random number generator with a specific seed so that I will get the same result each time. Uh, so RMD, RMD. Right, and then generate. So this is the new grid. So grid is now an I enumerable of int arrays. Why, why isn't that just an array of arrays? There you go. So now I'm going to, uh, for each row from 0 to 10, I'm going to output. Um, Enumerable range 0, 10, select column, uh, grid, row, column, join string, space. Okay, I strongly suspect that this will take a while. You will notice that it outputs some stuff here, but these are incomplete grids. The red part shows how much of it it hasn't managed to fill yet. So this algorithm might take a while to find a grid that actually satisfies this criterion that every number occurs exactly once in every row and column. 
But once it has found one, then we can use it. So I'm going to keep this running in the background. And um, in fact, I'm going to cancel this. And I'm going to change the seed because now I've already run a bit of it. And I'm going to run this detached from the Visual Studio debugger. So now this will run in the background. And in Visual Studio, I can switch back to the black hole module. OK, so what else needs to be done? Um, there is a sound that someone sent me, which I think is quite interesting, which uh, we could use for this module. Um, I have um, apparently I've not put the sound in here already, so let's put it in here. Let's open this in Explorer. Let's create a new folder called Sounds, and um, I believe that. Uh, I can probably uh, show you this. Uh, there's probably not much. Uh, as you can see, this person created some sounds for me for Rubik's Cube and Symbol Cycle, so there are quite a lot of uh, files here. But here's the black hole sock and black hole input. Actually, as I say this, I very strongly suspect that. Ah, there we go. They're in my temp folder. OK. We found it. We've done it, Redis. So. Let's go to temp and move black hole input to contain a uh, black hole asset sounds. And then we do the same with black hole suck. Put that in there. OK, so now we have these two sounds here. Uh, let's quickly check up, check up on our grid generator. It's still not done. So um, now I'm going to. Take those both, take those two sounds, add them to the mod.bundle. And while I'm at it, also add the black hole module to the mod bundle. There we go. Um, and I also need to add them to the uh, uh, to the test harness so that the sounds will actually play in Unity. What what is going on? I thought I just oh I see. Um, okay, there we go. Okay, now they're there. Now, black hole input, I will use when a number has been successfully inputted. And black hole suck, I'm going to use when the module is solved. So um, let's save the scene, go back to Visual Studio, and um, let's do the handle pass first. So when we solve the module, we are going to play a sound called um, black hole suck at the current transform. Or maybe at the transform of the hole. Except we don't. Oh, it's called selectable. Isn't there? We go. Selectable dot transform. Because the selectable is the thing that we click. That's where the sound should come from. Okay. And then um, when a digit. Okay. So in in every other case of entering a correct digit, we're gonna call this. We're gonna play this sound. And now let's take a look or take a listen. Let me quickly check if, yep, you, you should be able to hear these sounds when they play. I'm going to enter a zero here. Yeah, that seems to work. Um, but that's not quite, that's not quite right, is it? Yeah, this sound sounds more like something that should be playing in the background while you try to do your clicking. But um, let's just uh, solve this one and then see what it sounds like when you uh, finish solving it. So now we've entered 6, so the next one should solve it. Here we go. Maybe at this point the black hole should actually collapse and disappear. At least that's what the sound sounds like. Oh, you're not hearing the sound. Oh, I don't know how to fix that. Um, actually, let me check if my uh, sound... Oh, I see. No, that is correct. I am piping the sound to voice meter input, and then voice meter should... Uh, let me see if the um, wiggle thing here happens when the sound plays. Oh, come on. OK, yes, you can see from this bar that the sound was playing in uh, voice meter. So let's take a look at OBS settings. Uh, 
oh, I see, I'm actually recording the speakers rather than voice meter input. Let's uh, record that instead. And I hope that you can still hear me. I mean, my mic is still working, um, it's still wiggling. So, um, Kate says, let me know if you can hear it now. Did you hear that? That works. Okay, thank you. Very good. Okay. Um, so, um, so maybe what I want to do is I want to start playing that sound the first time you mouse down on the module. And then while you do your um, gesture, that sound will play. And then if you, if you have an unsuccessful gesture, you'll get a strike, so the strike sound plays. And if you get a successful gesture, then maybe part of that suck sound should happen. Let's open that suck sound in Audacity and take something uh, from it. Let's open contain black hole asset sounds. Um, this one. So maybe maybe only this last part should play, like you know. <laughs> this sound is so cool. Okay, so let's let's take a copy of this, make a new file, paste it here, and uh, let's use a fade in. Wink. Ah, this is great. Hello, Lucas. How are you? Okay. Um. So that that's the sound. So let's export that to um. Uh, black hole. Come on. Oh, I see. Black hole asset sounds. Um. Black hole suck short. I guess. Whoops. No. I want that to be an org file. Because Audacity, you know, outputs org files. Oof, buffer, fine. Okay, mm. I'm sorry if my stream is buffering. I don't think there's anything I can do about it. My internet is not the best. Um, okay, so now, the first time that I mouse down, so let's see. Um, um, there is a, there we go. This is the mouse down event. And at this point, I'm going to say uh, if events. Uh, all, if all of the events so far are tick, then audio.play sound black hole suck short on uh, selectable.transform. So only the first mouse down will start playing it. And then when we process the digit and it's a correct one, which is here, uh, then we do the suck short. Oh, I see. The other one should be input, like whole input. There you go. Okay, now let's go to Unity. Let's add the new um, sound file that we just created to the audio clips. There we go. Save the scene. Run the program. And let's try this. Oh my gosh, this is awesome. Okay, now if I if I get a strike on this, it'll sound as if the sound would just uh, abruptly stop. But on the bomb, of course, you get the strike sound at this point. So that's actually pretty cool. So um, let's try and play this with a um, you know with a realistic uh, code, so that um, so, so that I can test if the timing is uh, reasonable. So I'm gonna remove all of this debug code and use the real. Uh, solution code, which is here we go one four three 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 four zero four zero one two three three zero haha <laughs> you know what I'm actually going to write it down um somewhere like here there we go um if 
right? This way I can see. Uh, there we go. When you get a strike because of incorrect code, you need to still clear the code. This has not. Um, it has happened uh, here at handle strike. Events not clear happens here. Or what do you mean by clear the code? It doesn't clear the. I mean this. Your it doesn't clear your progress if that's what you mean. But it does clear the sort of mouse event so that you you can start entering a new uh, digit. So let's um, start again. So we're at stage one with the first digit. Oh crap! I restarted, so now I get a different code. I'm stupid. Okay, so here's the the actual code. There you go. And so the first one is a three, which is oh come on. I'm okay. I'm going to remove all of this stuff so that I can see that. Okay. So we want a three, which is two consecutive of these. Oh wow, Unity is lagging. Let me very quickly check something because sometimes Unity uses a lot of uh, memory. Oh yeah, 35 gigabytes. Okay, I have to exit Unity and start it again. 35 gigabytes of RAM is not acceptable. Maybe this is uh, part of the reason for your buffering that you saw earlier. Yes, Aperture Prince, the, those sound effects are absolutely awesome. Um, let's see, Black Hole. So now let's try this again. And let's try it with this code, which is this code. OK. So we want a 0. I know how to do a 0. Click. That was correct. Now I'm going to enter a 2, which is click and then hold. OK, go. Hmm. Okay, so the uh, hold sound was slightly too short for that. So let's consider making it slightly longer. Next one is a one, which is simply two clicks. Click, click. Next one is a zero, which ooh, strike. I miss click. Okay, there we go. Now two again is click and then hold. Yep, that definitely needs to be slightly longer. Now we have a one, which is click, click, and then we have three of those. So, click, 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 click. Wow. Now we have a zero, which is just a hold. Oh, it didn't register that. Interesting. Oh. Oh, duh, this module is now solved because I've done the first seven, right? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, so it probably ignored this. So the next one is probably a one. Yep, it accepted only two of the ones. I didn't pay attention to the log at all. So I have to move to the other module and enter another one here. There we go. Oh, I entered a zero. The one is two clicks. So let's click and then click. That's that, and then we need a four, which is a long hold. Yeah, and that holding sound does need to be a little longer. So then we have a two, which is click and then hold. And then a long hold. And finally the zero, which is just a, a short hold. Uh, no, don't worry, Aperture Prince. I'm going to do that myself because um, I've got your uh, sounds here and I'm just going to make it longer. So, black hole input. Um, this is the one. I'm just going to um, change tempo, percent speed. I don't know. So, 50 doesn't make it shorter or longer. Uh, that makes it shorter. Okay, so I want it approximately. Let's make it 10% longer, is that? Yeah, that should be enough. 
try that. Ooh. Okay, that actually made it shorter. I'm confused. So, um, in that case, let's say 90. That also made it shorter. Okay, maybe this is not actually in percent as I... No, it does say percent change. Um, okay, I, I can change the length from 2.6 to 3 seconds. Which is a bit too much. Let's say two point. Let's say two point eight seconds. Ah, okay. I should have needed to use a negative number. Got it. Okay. Okay, that's not much of a change. Let's um. Maybe it does need to be three seconds. Okay. All right. Um. Let's export that, and um, I'm gonna keep the old one around for now and use this one. There you go. And then here, uh, please exit play mode. Thank you. In the test harness, I'm going to add the second input sound. There we go. Um, save the scene, run this. Now let's see. We need a one. You entered, oh, I entered down, tick, up, tick, tick, which is, yes, it is a valid digit, it's a zero. I mean, it is wrong, I should have gotten strike. Oh, there is a zero. Okay, so why does it say this? Ah, wait, 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 when I handle this, no, it does, I, I do, okay. That was the bug I was talking about. Well, but I do clear the events here, so why does the bug happen, do you know? Ah, okay, let me see this. When you get a strike because of incorrect code, you need, yeah. But if the strike is because of an incorrect digit rather than an invalid input. Yeah. Oh. Oh. Ah. Thank you. Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Oh my gosh, that was an oversight. Wait a second. Uh yeah, no, that that is fine. Okay. Here we go again. I want a 4. 4 was a long press. That is cool. That is so cool. Then we want a three. Now it was three. It's a press and a long, a short press and another short press. There we go. That is cool. Now we have a zero, which is this. You enter. Oh, uh, okay. I got the timing wrong. Fine. Let's try that. There you go. That was a zero, which is correct. Um. So that was four three zero. Then we have two two four. So let's do a two. Um, and a 4. 2, 2, 4. Uh, then we want a another 2, and then we're going to move to the other module. Yeah. Okay, three four three three zero one one. Three four three three zero one one. Let's uh get that. Um Okay, so three is you know what, I'll just put that here. Haha. <laughs> Why didn't I think of that? Okay, so three is that. Okay. And a four. And a strike, I made a mistake. Okay, let's try another three. And another three, and now we need a zero. Why is it not scrolling down automatically? Come on. I know you can do it, Unity. Um, so that leaves with two ones. So let's do that, 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 and that. This is so awesome. 
the sounds are awesome, but the visuals, you know, could really be more... Um, it, it really does feel like the black hole should collapse at the end. If someone can find a good way of animating that, making it look really cool, that would be great. But in the meantime, I guess I'm going to leave it like this. So, the module is now properly playable, I believe. We've um, added all of the visuals, all of the sounds that we wanted, all of the gameplay. Um, I know one song from Pink Floyd, which is um, uh, another break in the wall. Why do you ask? <laughs> um, okay. So I guess the next thing I oh yes that's right I wanted to oh the 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 grid let's see oh it still hasn't finished generating a grid so I'm going to let this algorithm run overnight and hopefully at some point it will have found a ten by ten grid um in the live shows they have that <laughs> no I do not go to live shows I do not watch them no sorry I don't know anything about that but that's okay. Right, um, so I guess the next thing I'm going to do is I'm going to create the manual, because uh, at the moment I only have this, um, uh, uh, there's this Google Doc, which is this one here. Um, I don't know if you guys noticed this, but Firefox, uh, you know, closed itself. I just had to reopen it again. Um, it probably did that because of the memory problem on Unity, that Unity was allocating 30 gigabytes of RAM. I don't know why it does that. If any of you have any ideas how to fix that, then let me know. At the moment, it's at a modest one gigabyte. Um, but yeah. Um, okay, so let's, let's, uh, let's make a manual, shall we? Let's take our trusty text editor, put it like here or something. Um, and let's let's open a manual uh, for some other like I don't know Simon Simon screams I suppose Simon screams yeah okay let's let's use that and save it as a black oh I already have a black hole .html. what is that <laughs> okay this this is an older version where I thought I would I was gonna have planets orbiting the black holes and you have to knock them into the black hole so no. Um, right, let's, let's get rid of this. Um, hmm, I did already have this idea with the fourth and this, uh, seventh digit of the serial number. Right, okay, well, anyway. So, here we go. On the subject of black hole. Let's copy all of this text. Um, and then at the beginning of each of these lines, we put li. And then we, uh, indent all of that and okay and then we're going to take a look at what this looks like there we go mm, yeah uh, see in google docs it still kind of fits on the page but here there's very little space on the bottom of the page so i'm going to space this out and have all of the tables on the second page so I'm going to add a style attribute and tell all the LIs to have a margin of half a line height or maybe an entire line height. Yep, that still fits on the page, except I don't want a left or right margin, so that fits more like it. Um, so, um... The following table explains how to enter each digit. Now, in the uh, Google Docs, I have these sort of textual explanations, but I have since decided that I'm going to actually make this uh, different. I'm going to have actual sort of diagrams that look kind of like this. I mean, not exactly this, but um, I'm going to fire up Inkscape. Um, and I'm going to create um, a series of, you know, five little diagrams that look a little bit like this. So let's make it so that I can still see them. Um, uh, let's make this, so each diagram should probably be, I don't know, 10 by 5, and there are 5, so make it 50 by 5, I guess. 50 by 5. Okay. Well, apparently it doesn't like small numbers, so let's make it 500 by 50. There we go. Okay, and then we add a grid. 
of 10 by 10. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Okay, so um, I probably want to add a uh, frame around all of it, which does not have any fill, but it has a stroke, which should be two pixels or something, I guess. Um, and then I'm going to add divider line one here, which should not have a fill, it should have a stroke of two pixels. Right, and then we copy that to here, here, and here. Right, now, um, for the first one, we're going to have, uh, I do want that one to have a fill and no stroke. Uh, yep, that looks more like it. So one, so this one really only needs three dots. So I should probably um, move it like, here, one, two, three. Okay, that's still not centered, but I'll move it later. So um, now I'm going to draw something like this and have it not have a fill, have it a stroke. Uh, yeah, one pixel for this one is fine. And now I'm going to move it over five units so that it's actually between the dots. There you go. And then I can move the whole thing five units. Click, and now it's in the middle. And that actually looks like a bit of a smiley. Okay, um, and then for number one, we we still need the same dots. So I'm just going to copy that here. And instead of that, we're just going to have a line here and a line here. And both of them should have no fill, stroke, stroke with one. There you go. Next one. Now the next one requires at least four dots. So let's um, copy that to here. Three, whoops, four. Okay, that's four dots and it is centered, very good. So let's get rid of that and take a copy of this, put that here, oh, perfect. Then the next one should have two brackets and that also requires four of these dots. Copy, paste. There we go. Delete that. Put that here. Now these, obviously, right? I'm I'm going to move this uh like I don't know 2.5 units. No, I think it's actually five units that I want. Yeah, there you go. Okay, it's not quite aligned with the dots. Yeah, actually, maybe I should align it better. Yeah, okay. So I am actually gonna move this 2.5 to the right. And this 2.5 to the left. And that's, yeah, that's probably a bit clearer, but I'm still gonna actually move those dots onto the grid points. There we go. Okay, and then the last one also requires four dots. So I'm, I'm, I'm gonna copy and paste this one. Uh, here we go. Delete that and just modify this by moving those dots to here. Okay, and now I am going to add the uh, digits 0, 1, 2, 3, 4 um, above this. So the uh, page size should now be, I don't know, 70? Yeah, maybe a bit more, 80, right? Actually, maybe a bit more and make it 90. Okay, and I want this to be for some reason, it always remembers, you know, fonts and fill and stroke exactly when you don't want it to, you know? Um, like, you know, I want this fill to be on, the stroke to be off, the fill should be zero, right? The font size should be smaller, 28. Yep, 28 is perfect. Let's put that here. Take a copy of that, put it here, here. Oh, made a mistake there, here, here. Change that to a one, to a two, three, four. Okay. Okay, these should be fine. Okay. Now I'm going to um, save this as um, 
because this is going to be a temporary file because I'm going to actually embed the SVG directly in the HTML. So for now, I'm just going to put it in dtemp, temp.svg, replace that file, take a look at it. And there we go. That's more or less what we want. Um, I will get to the, I mean, you will notice that the width of the lines is inconsistent. This is because the edge of the SVG cuts right into the line, but of course not the top line. I'm going to address this later, but for now, um, let's open that SVG file in, uh, uh, so this is what it looks like when uh, Inkscape creates these. This is a pretty large file and it has a lot, a lot of extraneous information in it that uh, that we don't need. So I always copy and paste this into this website, which is called SVGO's Missing GUI. SVGO is a, um, a minifier, an SVG sort of minimization program, which turns this whole thing into just this little bit of code without any um, extraneous stuff and without any changes to it. So now if I reload that uh, temp file, you will see it still looks exactly the same. Now, um, I noticed that there is um let me let me just quickly do this again because I believe that there is an option here to um let me very quickly look through this. Um there was something relating to um the style attribute versus um using other attributes. Um style to attributes. This is on. But it didn't actually change all of the. See, there, there are still sort of style things here. Um, come on, that's, that doesn't seem to have any effect. Well, okay. Well, we'll live with it. Um, so um, there's quite a lot. There's still quite a lot of information here that is not necessary. Like a lot of these things here, like you know, text line, line height, etc. Most of these are. Um, the uh, default values. And notice that I even remember the old name of the font that, that was selected before I changed it to uh, uh, special elite. It has special elite here on the T-span element, but on the outer text element, it still has this federal escort laser font. That is really frustrating. So I'm going to um, manually change things. Text the line center. I, I don't think that is even necessary, so let's replace all instances of this with nothing and reload it here. As you can see, it's still perfectly fine. I can replace the empty style tags and it's still perfectly fine. I'm going to replace uh, these because this is Inkscape specific stuff that has no effect on the... Uh, okay, and then we don't need things like word spacing. Uh, let's get rid of that. And there's another font family here get rid of that. Uh, we don't need, um, okay, we do, we do need font size. So I'm actually going to move this to the top of here so that it, it provides some kind of default value. And then for the rest of this, I'm going to remove all instances of that. And um, font size, ooh, the font size is actually 28. That, that's what I thought. Uh, <laughs> so let's, Remove all of those as well. Boink. And it still looks the same. I'm surprised that it, it maintained a transform in this, but who cares? Um I bet that if I remove this transform it will still look no, it does not look the same. Okay, fine. So there is actually a change there. Right, uh this is very likely not necessary. Let's delete that. Letter spacing. I don't need let. I also don't need font weight. Let's delete that. Let's also replace double spaces. Okay. Now all of these text elements seem to have fill and stroke. Well, actually, I do want them to have fill and stroke, but uh, there's something here: stroke with two on a text element. Why would that be the case? Um, this is it for the number four? Why would that? See, it, it says fill none. Oh, but then the T-span element overwrites. Jesus, that is absolutely redundant. So within all of this part, let's remove all of these. And it's looking much smaller now. Let's also remove this because we don't need that. OK, 
Okay, I think I've had enough of this now. This is now small enough. Um, in fact, one last thing I can do is I can move font family up to the top so that that becomes a, uh, a default value so I can remove all the other ones. And at this point, I'm going to stop. Um, this is small enough, so I'm going to go here. I'm going to create a second page here. Uh, well, let's put the div there, the, the SVG there, then copy this div. Uh, there we go. Do that and then remove this. And also remove this, this, this. Um, oh, yeah. There needs to be another flash div and div. And let's, let's also change the, um, you know, the background numbers so that the smudges on the page are different. Um, okay. Where did the page numbers go? I think I messed up here. So let's go back to Simon Screams, which there we go. This, this line here somehow got lost. Um, let's see. Oh, wow. I messed this up big time. This should be here. That's right. So here is page one of two. And then here we have page two of two. Okay, now let's uh, reload that. And here we go. Now I'm going to address the inconsistent width because uh, it's actually quite easy to do. So first of all, I'm going to remove this width height and instead change it to a view box, which uh, says that, you know, the width and height of the uh, elements inside it is 590, but the um, the actual size of the thing can be anything. So as you can see, Firefox now automatic automatically stretches it to the width of the page. And I'm going to say that the view box actually goes from negative 2, negative 2 to 504, 94. And that'll just sort of give it a little bit of extra buffer, and now the lines all show. There you go. The next thing is I, I need to write an explanation for what these graphics mean. So um, the following page explains how to enter each digit. And also in the 10 by 10 grid on the next page. Let's change that. Okay. So how do we explain um, in the above diagrams a uh, dot represents a tick of the bombs countdown timer, i.e. a change of the seconds value. A change in the seconds value? Um, someone help me here, some of you native speakers. Is it a change in or a change of? Uh, which one is better? Um, a vertical line represents a tap on the module. Make sure that you touch and release or press and release the module between two ticks. Uh, in. Thank you. Change in the second one. Thank you. Mi minus like JS. Um, a bracket indicates a holding, holding the module across a uh, across one or more ticks. Um, okay. In the above diagrams, a dot represents a tick of the bombs count. Wow, somebody actually pronounced it. Oh, mine. Yeah. <laughs> oh, hi, fantastic. Yeah. Um, I I had to decode it first. You know, I mean, there's no indication where the uh, spaces between the words are. It could have been minors, slick, slick edges. I don't know. You know, miners like JS that uh, seem, seem the most sensible to me. So in the above diagrams, a dot represents a tick of the bombs count on timer, i.e. a change in the second value. A vertical line represents a tap on the module. Make sure that you press and release the module between two ticks. Um, I'm going to emphasize the word end here. Uh, and press and release the module between two ticks. A bracket indicates holding the module across one or more ticks. Is this clear? Um, fantastic. Uh, you can tell me if if this explanation makes sense and if it, you know, if it if it's clear from the description what what the diagram actually means. In the meantime, 
Um, I'm going to, okay, let, let's see if my algorithm oh, still hasn't generated a 10 by 10 grid. Well, that's okay. Um, I'll just let it run overnight. Let me see what the, uh, hmm. Interesting that it uses 2.8 gigabyte, gigabytes of RAM for that algorithm, but at least it's not growing. You know, it was 2.8 before, I think, and it's still 2.8. It looks good if, if you know what the mod... Well, yeah, but that's the thing. It needs to be clear to someone who doesn't know what the module, or rather what the um, input mechanism is. So if you have any suggestions on how to improve that uh, uh, d description or this explanation, then please let me know. Okay, so... Um, I suppose I should also say that time goes from left to right. So um, a dot represents a tick of the bounce count on timer going from left to right. Okay. Um, okay, and then I guess I'm gonna just uh, put the 10 by 10 grid here and I guess I can enter the, the, the numbers into it later. So here we want a table, and I'm going to give that a class attribute called the grid. Um, and then we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And each row has 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. There we go. And in table.grid, we want with 100%. Boink. Um, well, let, let's also put some digits in there. So like this, I guess. Okay, right, we want them centered, don't we? So TD, text the line center. Okay, maybe I don't actually want it 100%. Let's make it 90%. And uh, let's also center it, which we do like this. There we go. And then maybe I also want the table rows to have the same height. Actually, instead of with 90, I'm going to um, so every column should have the same width. Let's make it, um, let, let's, let's just experiment with this a bit. So, um, this needs a column group with 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 columns in it. Boink. Okay, so that is 1 centimeter. So let's make it 1.5 centimeters. Yeah. Yeah, it's a bit big. I don't know. Let's make it 1.2. I mean, I know that it doesn't uh, fill the page yet, but I think... Okay, so I think I want the top margin here to be significant. I'll make it 3 em like that. Okay, so there is a bit of um, gap in there. And I suppose we can also increase the font size a little. Yeah, that's good. Okay, so at this point I'm done, uh, or rather I will be done once the algorithm finishes generating my 10 by 10 grid. Um, so, thank you all for watching. Um, how long have we been doing this? I guess we started at 23.15, I guess. And now it's um, 1 o'clock, so that's 1 hour 45. I think that's a good chunk. What is that algorithm doing? It Oh, okay, that algorithm is trying to find a grid of numbers from 0 to 9, a 10 by 10 grid of numbers 0 to 9, such that every row and column has every number exactly once. And then once I have that, I'm going to take everything modulo 5 so that every number from 0 to 4 occurs exactly two times in every row or column. I've done the same thing with several other um, modules of mine. Uh, that uh, grid generation algorithm is uh, pretty old. So, for example, in Friendship, uh, which I don't know if you know the, oops, that's the names, in Friendship, right, if you um, look at this closely, you will notice that actually no row and column contains the exact, the exact same, like, okay, there are no duplicates, right? Um, and no, it's not quite like a Sudoku, you know, it doesn't do the, um, 
you know, the groupings, the three by three. In a Sudoku, you have a nine by nine grid, which is also subdivided into a three by three subgrid, right? You can't really do that with a 10 by 10. I mean, you could subdivide it into five by five subgrids, I suppose, but then you have only four of those. Anyway, the algorithm doesn't do that. The algorithm only finds uh, rows and columns. But yes, it is a little bit like Sudoku. And I have, I have actually used it to generate Sudokus at some point, but I don't remember what for. I mean, it was something Katain related, but I don't remember what it was. It must have been some abandoned idea. Okay, so it just occurred to me that one last thing that is missing is the SVG up here in the corner. So I'm going to create that now. Uh, let's run another instance of in Inkscape. Double O. Dub. <sighs> no, unfortunately not. Um, because for double O, I needed not just a Sudoku, I needed a double Sudoku such that every you know, every two-digit combination occurs exactly once. And, you know, anyway, I googled for that, and I even asked on math.stackexchange about that, and they sent me a link to some pre-generated things like that, and uh, I used that for double O. But very good guess for double O, that uh, I hadn't thought of it. So let's save this as blackhole.svg and not make it full screen. Uh, there you go. Okay, um, I don't know if I want the swirls to be part of the SVG. I mean, I kind of do want that, but it's, it's a lot of work. So for now, I'll just not bother. Instead, I will just have uh, two copies of the same uh, circle here. I'm going to arrange them so that they're exactly on top of each other. One of them is going to be a black, so that's already correct. The other one, I'm going to give a fat stroke of 10 uh, with a color, um, a stroke paint, something like this. Now, I'm a bit surprised. Oh, I see. No, I don't see. Um, this is the opacity, isn't it? Um, Oh, okay. Oh, I get it. I'm an idiot. Um, okay, wh what do I actually want? Okay, let's, let's make this um, semi-transparent. And let's change the color of the black hole just to see what it looks like if I do. Yeah. Yeah, that's not quite what I was looking for. So let's, let's just do this. Um, I suppose I could have the outer one be colored, you know, like, like like this, and and then it looks like it does on the module, but oh, that's what I should do. I can make it. There we go. This is what I wanted. I can make it gray, uh, without okay, right. So yeah, I th I think that looks good. Let's make it one fifty. Okay, so let's uh, save that. Let's open that. Component, uh, black hole, copy and paste that into this website. Ah, nice and small. Thank you. And by the way, I have a little regular expression here, which I sometimes use to remove uh, extraneous information that uh, Inkscape adds and this website still doesn't remove. As you can see, oh, okay, it, it didn't make it even smaller, but there you go, it's, it's now smaller. Okay. So that's the SVG done. Uh, let's close that, close that. OK, so now if I go back, whoops, I closed it. I did not mean to close it. So now if I reload this, there we go. We have our preview image. And it looks very much like the module. Actually, now that I think about it, now it does look like, a, like the module. I, I thought that maybe the, um, you know, the outline is actually thicker on the module, but I don't think it is. I think it's approximate. Maybe, yeah, no, I think it's fine. I'll leave it. OK. Now let's uh, generate a PDF for that. Generate that PDF, uh, black hole. There we go. And uh, let's go to Katane and do this. Right, so why do I do this? Well, you see, I have this uh, public folder, which is essentially a copy of the uh, Katane website, you know, this website which has all of the manuals in it, right? But then, of course, there's another copy of the manual in the folder for the module, the one that goes on GitHub 
and the PDF that is that becomes part of the module bundle. So I have this um, batch file that will just copy it from the, you know, from the public directory for the website into the one for the module. So now I have both of those copies up to date. So now if I go uh, to Unity and um, press F6 to recompile this, then we should have a perfectly viable module. And I suppose we can try running it on the uh, in the actual game. Now it's warning me that some of the sounds are not tagged. Indeed, those two. Let's tag those. There you go. I suppose I can actually delete black hole input, or at least not include it in the bundle, because I'm not using it anymore. So that's good. Okay, dummy module, I don't want that included. Black hole input, okay, I want that excluded. Okay, so now let's go to my um, mods folder, which as you can see contains you know, pretty much all of the mods that I uh, made over the years. And I'm going to, right, so I want camera zoom, I want black hole, and I want something that I can very easily do. So let's let's also move alphabet over so that, you know, I can, you know, instead of alphabet, really, I want to use um, anagrams of word scramble. Those are literally the easiest ones. So I'm actually going to do that. Let's see, uh, anagram. Uh, that's this one here. Go here, copy that directory here. Okay, so now I've copied that from the workshop into my local mods folder. Now if I run Katain, it will include only those three mods, camera zoom, black hole, and anagrams. Hmm, maybe I should also include the bomb creator. This one. Uh, let's copy that to here, there we go. By the way, can you guys see the game? Does it transmit correctly on the stream? Please let me know. Um, okay. Um, yeah, let's do that. Let's let's have. I suppose three modules is fine. Uh, I want lots of strikes just for testing, and I think that's it. Uh, be sure to look at the back side. Yeah, okay, there you go. I've looked at it. <laughs> okay, now let's um, try and solve this module. Okay, so our serial number is... Um, okay, so the numbers we want is 1 and 4. Um, we have only one black hole, but that's good. Um, so let's go back here. Now this is not... It, it currently uses the grid that is here, so I'm gonna use that. Um, so 1 and 4. So we start here. Um, now what was... Okay, so the, the first digit is a 4, but I can't remember how to calculate the uh, initial um, orientation. So let's take a look. Um, your initial direction of movement is the number of ports on the bomb clockwise from north. Okay, so we have literally zero ports, so it's actually north. So, we start here, and we go north. So that's a four, we go north, and then we do one and two, that's a three. Then we do those three, which is four. Then we do one, two, three, four, that's four plus one is five, which is zero, and then we land here, and then we do uh, five of these, so it's, uh, that's again zero, and now we're here. Okay, I'm going to try this so far and see if I get a strike. Four. How do I do a four? I have forgotten. Let's take a look at the manual. Okay, that's how I do a four. That sounds like it was correct. Uh, and now I'm going to... Okay, so I've done that, so let's move that down. So now I'm going to solve another module. Uh, banana. Boink. 
and we have much fewer swirls now. So the next digit is a three, which means, ah, okay. Yeah, that worked. Okay, now let's solve this, which is Duster. And we have only one swirl left, and that should be a four. Now I remember how to do a four. <laughs> the black hole sound lined up with the uh, winning fanfare. Okay. I think I'm happy with this. If you guys are happy with this, I'm happy with this. So, what I'm going to do now... Nice. Okay, very good. So what I'm going to do now is I'm going to upload this to the Steam Workshop and I'm going to make it friend friends only so all of you can playtest it. For the, for the time being, I suppose I'm going to put the grid from the... Uh, uh, you know, this. Let, let's take a look at the, oh, the algorithm is still running. Okay, so I'm gonna put this grid in there, um, which actually I can do much more easily by going here, because I've got my grid here. I'm just gonna, oh, wait. I cannot run this exe file, because that's actually what's running here. That's that exe file, so unfortunately I can't do that. So I'm, I'm just, since this is temporary anyway, I'll just, uh, um, I think I want to, you know what, I'm just going to copy this. I'm going to use another one of my, uh, it's, it's, it's called temp, which also has a lot of code in it that literally does nothing, uh, nothing useful anyway. So, um, which of these do I want? I want this one. Right, and now each line should be a table row containing, um, containing table cells. There you go, and the grid has, okay, let's remove that underscore. Um, so for each row, we go through the 10 columns, we generate those, we don't want spaces between them, right? And then um, I'm gonna use a, a string builder and say append line. And then I'm going to put this into the clipboard and run this. Let me very quickly take a look at this. Ooh, the memory usage of that grid algorithm did actually increase, but three gigabytes is still fine. Um, okay, so now it's in my clipboard, so I can go here. I don't want to full screen that. Uh, let's move that here, do that, and go back to here. And instead of all of these zeros here, we put that. Ta-da! Okay. Um, and then I suppose I can uh, generate a new PDF from that. There you go, now the numbers are here. Let's print that, save, uh, black hole PDF, and then uh, go to here and uh, update the manual. There we go. Uh, and now I'm going to submit this to GitHub, first of all. Um, so, uncommitted changes, there you go, first playable version, push that. And then while that is pushing, let's recompile this with a new manual PDF, and, and then TP code. I, I'll do that before. Um, <laughs> yeah, actually the TP code might be quite interesting. Do you guys want to see me implement the uh, Twitch Plays code? Um, let me know. I will uh, upload in the meantime. Oh, this already has a workshop file ID. That sounds like a problem. I'm going to check what that number is. Oh my gosh, it's super logic. Okay, that means, I know what this means. That means that my uh, blank project from which I started has, um, has the number in. There you go. That, let's make that a zero. Right, and then that should be a zero. So description, don't get sucked in. Um, we don't have a preview image yet. I forgot to take a, uh, 
I forgot to take a uh, screenshot while we were in the game, so I guess I'm gonna have to do that at some point. Oh my god, it's super logic. Okay, whatever. Um, right. Um, first playable version. Okay, let's create a new workshop item. Are you not going to remove all those dummy modules? Um, they are not in the compiled version. So when I upload this to the workshop, those will not contain the dummy modules. But for the Unity project, those dummy modules are useful for testing. So I think I'm going to leave them in. Because that way I can um, you know, test, test the module or test any future changes. And I can also test the Twitch Plays code and everything. So uh, let's go here and change it from hidden to friends only. So all of you can, oh my gosh, that's, that's brilliant. I'm gonna leave that, that, that preview image. <laughs> I'm going to leave it black. <laughs> uh, you guys tell me if you think that's a dumb idea. I'm, uh, you know, I'm open to suggestion. Let's see, um, I want to close Unity, I guess. That's actually awesome. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so, next thing. Um, oh yeah, the GitHub thing. Um, I suppose I can take a quick look at this. Contain a uh, black hole. There you go, three commits. There you go, first playable version. Yep, everything's there. The black hole sucked up the ball. <laughs> okay. Uh, Twitch Plays. Shall we implement it? Let me know if you if you are interested. In which case, I will do it. I will do it now. Okay, I guess I can get rid of this and open that. Okay. So if nobody uh, wants to see the Twitch Plays code, then um, um, oh, okay, I can, yeah, you're right, I can just um, commit this, stage that, uh, stage that, stage that, um, black hole manual, there you go. Okay, so now, um, it won't be listed on the main page, but you can go here, and, uh, oh, and, right, if I reload this page, there we go, black hole, right, it's there. So here's the direct link to the web, to the uh, manual. Yay! Okay, so if nobody wants to see me do the Twitch plays, then I guess I'll end the stream here. Um, please speak up now if you want it. Otherwise, you know, I will I will do it off stream, or or maybe I'll do it next. No, cool. So um, right um. <laughs> do it. Of course you would want me to do it, Kate says. <laughs> All right, fine. Uh, do, oh, okay, there we go. Two voices. Oh, three voices. Okay, okay, I will do it. Here we go. So, I want the Twitch plays commands to um, mimic the sequence of, uh, you know, mouse events, so down and up, and waiting for the timer, so like tick. Okay? So, I'm going to, so first of all, I'm going to go to some other module, like I don't know, Rubik's Cube, and copy uh, this bit here. There you go. Put that here. Okay, here is my Twitch help message. Uh, here's my command. That. If it's solved, then you'll break. No. No. <laughs> don't do it. Okay. Um, Enter a sequence now. Um, uh, how do you phrase this? Um, enter now. Um,
for example, um, so I, I guess I'm going to use the word hold and release instead of uh, up and down because those are the words that I also used in the manual. So for example, um, uh, hold, tick, release, or um, hold, release, tick, hold, release. Actually, I suppose I can use tap as a um, um, synonym for hold and release. Best if I went to hold, release, tap, or wait for a timer tick in the correct order, for example, that. Okay. Right. So, um, so first of all, uh, let's uh, lowercase this, and then uh, also, also trim it, and also split it at the commas, um, right? And then each of those, I suppose we also want to trim those. Uh, turn that back into an array. Um, okay, var pieces. Um, I think I want to lowercase each individual bit. There we go. And and the trim here can go. So, right. Um, var actions equals list of uh, selectable. So this list, now actually let's make it a list of objects so I can literally just yield return each. So um, for, for each var piece in pieces, so I suppose I can literally just do this. Um, switch piece, uh, case, um, I'm, I, I'm going to allow down, but I'm going to uh, use hold as the uh, as the main command, um, actions add um, um, selectable uh, and um, new wait for second point one break. Okay, the next one is release or up. Um, you know, actually. Um, I don't want to return the selectable, I want to call on interact and stuff. So I'm actually going to do this and say selectable.oninteract. And then later I will take care of the fact that this is, uh, yeah, you, you, you'll see it in a second. And then case tap, uh, case click, actions.add, um, at this point, I suppose I can literally just do this because Twitch Plays will handle that for me. Um, no, I think I, I no, I think I want to do that myself. So I'll, I'll do this. There you go. Break. Um, and then finally, uh, tick or wait, I suppose. Um, Um, okay, let's make this a function that returns an object and that function will take the current time, which is uh, the integer get time like that. And then we're going to return wait until um, bomb.get time end is not equal to time, like that. Yeah, like that. Okay, and and then for, for any, um, there you go, for, for any invalid input, we're going to return null. Um, hmm, do I want to use enumerator or do I want to I, I do have to use I enumerated, don't I? So, okay, yield break. Uh, in, in that case, then let's just yield break. So, if at any point during this processing, uh, okay, it says, all right, fine. Uh, happy? 
Okay, so if at any point during the processing any of the pieces is not one of those words, then I want it to yield break, which means that it will do nothing. So even if the first few uh, commands are valid, it will not do any of it if any one of them is invalid, just to be sure. So if it survives until after this for each loop, then um, make sure to remove empty entries. What empty entries? There are no empty entries. What do you mean empty entries? Oh, those empty entries. I see. Um, well, f actually, yeah, okay, right. I don't know. Okay, fine. I, I guess you're right. Um, string split options. Uh, yeah, okay. All right. Um, so now, for each of our action in actions, if action is action, then action, action, invoke. Else, if action is func object, then yield return func object action run that. Else, yield return action. Make sure, uh, yeah. Okay. Wait, you know, Kate, um, this was going to work in my version with only commas, right? I mean, there's no real reason to support it without commas, but yeah, okay, it's it's not a big deal. I'll just allow it. Okay. So after this, do I want to wait for another point one seconds? I think I do, because otherwise, you know, it will click like literally instantly as the timer changes. And I don't want it to do that before the update function in the module has had a chance to um has had a chance to process the uh the the timer tick. So so I think this is sensible. Um oh wow you're right. <laughs> it is. Okay well Thank you, Kate says. I did actually miss that. Okay. Let's uh, test this. Oh, is Unity doing something again? Oh, it's only 1.1 gigabyte. Why is it not running? Okay, apparently Unity has uh, decided to um, just uh, freeze. Okay, now it has unfrozen for some reason. But it's it's still kind of unresponsive. Okay, now it seems to be working. Okay, thank you. So, ooh, I accidentally clicked on a module. Clicking on the text box also clicks on the module. Right, okay, so we want a, a two. Now what was two again? Two is okay, so that's um tap, tick, um and then hold, tick, release. You entered a two, which is correct. And then we want a three, which is um hold, tick, release, hold. Take release. That works too. Very good. Now we need one, two, three, four zeros in a row. So we want to tick, uh, hold, tick, release, tick, and do that one, two, three, four times. Um, yeah, let's see if that works. Here we go. That worked perfectly. Um, and then we want a two, which is um, a tap, tick, uh, hold, tick, release. That gave me a strike. What did I? What did I put in? Tap, tick, 
hold tick. And it did two ticks here. That's um strange. I'm gonna try this again. Uh tap tick uh hold tick release. This time it worked. I am a little worried about this because you know that if that happens often on the stream then right also I noticed that it actually went into this other black hole module so um I'm guessing then that I cannot actually steer this one maybe my test harness uh can't do that uh let's oh kaboom yeah okay th this was because I um I clicked on the text box so for some reason that counts as a Tap. Okay, so um, the next digit should be a uh, three, which is um, tick, uh, down, tick, up, down, tick, up. And no nothing is going to happen because it sends it to the module on the right. So, okay. Well, I think I'm happy with this. I think this is working. So as long as you don't mix Twitch plays with mouse interaction, I think it works. Um, but, you know, I, I, th I think I still need to test it a bit more on a live bomb and on a stream. I'll, I, I'll do that some other time. So this actually went quicker than I expected. So that's good. Um, so um, thank you all for tuning in. I think we're done. I suppose I should probably recompile this and upload the new version with the Twitch Play support. Add uh, Twitch Play support. Uh, let's close and reopen that because of the bug. Okay. Um, I suppose I I do kind of want to actually make you know a proper uh, preview image that is literally black. So let's do that. Let's fill. Oops, I said fill. Fill this. And then I suppose I can resize this. I I want it to be a square because they're always squares. Uh, so let's resize it to 600 by 600. Save this as uh, contain um, what was it called? Black hole assets miscellaneous preview image. Yes. Do that. And let's also go uh, black hole assets uh, miscellaneous and let's use PNG crush on this. And it's gonna be like uh <laughs> tiny um okay um right i suppose now i can actually upload this so let's reopen this upload this run and while this is uploading i guess i can uh, so let's see twitch this is twitch play support um that's fine Regular mo yep, the module ID is no good. Preview image, okay. Uh, TP support, preview image, um, fix workshop item ID. There you go. And um, were there any changes to the manual? I think I, yeah, I already uploaded that. Okay. I think we are done. So thank you all for watching and go ahead and play test this module uh, or. Uh, to your heart's content and I will see you around some other time when maybe I will make another module or maybe I will do something else who knows thank you and goodbye